Let's turn in our hymn books to 328 and sing the hymn that was just introduced, Close to Thee. Thou my everlasting portion, more than friend or life to me, all along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee, all along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with Thee. Not for ease or worldly pleasure, nor for fame my prayer shall be. Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with Thee. Close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee. Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with Thee. Lead me through the veil of shadows, bear me o'er life's fitful sea. Then the gate of life eternal, may I enter, Lord, with Thee. Close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee. Then the gate of life eternal, may I enter, Lord, with Thee. Our Lord called the gate narrow. It's just as narrow as Christ Himself. That justification, sanctification, redemption that's in Him. And if we're in Him, then we're safe. Close to Thee. Can't be any closer than what we are already in Him. Let's take our Bibles and look in Ezekiel chapter 17. It took several weeks just to read through and comment on Ezekiel 16. And now... Ezekiel 17 continues with the word and. So this is all successive here. And I want to read from verse 1 down to verse 18 and make some comments concerning this prophecy that our Lord gave to Ezekiel. Remember, he's already in exile. And they are awaiting the full and final invasion of Nebuchadnezzar into Jerusalem to destroy both the city and the temple. And here we find a parable. All of us like stories. That's what parables are. This is a parable. It's a riddle of two eagles and a vine. And so here in verse 1 and 2, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, that shows us that this was not just Ezekiel sitting down and trying to think of a good illustration to communicate to those who were still left in Jerusalem, but this is the word of the Lord. And he said, Son of man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. Now, there remained only Judah and Benjamin as the far as the tribes of Israel and so from here forward it's described as the house of Israel that used to be a term that referred to the entire nation until the kingdoms were divided after Solomon's death and then for a while you read where a message was given to Israel that was the ten tribes of the north and then Judah kings of Israel kings of Judah now there's only Judah that remains and so here's a parable and a riddle that is to be given to the remaining tribe of Judah. And here Ezekiel's told to speak about something of a riddle and something of a parable. You might ask yourself, well, what's the difference? Well, a riddle is 
something that has a meaning but a bit of a puzzle. If you told somebody a riddle, they'd have to sit and think about the meaning. It's a puzzle to the understanding. But a parable is a story that illustrates a spiritual truth with something natural. So if you look around and see certain things that are natural, our Lord did that, spoke of a rock, spoke of a stream, water, a vine. Those were all parables that he used. So here it's a riddle in that its meaning needs to be explained or revealed. There's a deeper meaning which underlies the figurative form. That's what the gospel is. It's called the mystery. Mystery has to be revealed. People today try to simplify it, make it easy. Oh, it's just as easy as ABC. All you have to do is accept Jesus and believe and confess your sins and you're saved. No, there's the gospel's a mystery. Great is the mystery of God in this. How God, the question that people aren't answering is how God can be just and declare righteous, just sinners that he's purposed to save. It's not in the sinner for sure. And so a riddle has something even in its presentation that's obscure. And a parable is more like an allegory. It takes thought. The riddle exercises the mind as you think about it. And the parable is something that sticks to the memory. We all remember stories. And we remember parables in scripture. And so here, is the word then that Ezekiel is given. Now what is it? First we see, well there's two eagles, but the first eagle here in verses three through six. And say, thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar he cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into the land or land of traffic or merchandise. And he set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature whose branches turned toward him, and the roots thereof were made under him, and so it became a vine, and brought forth branches, and shot forth sprigs. So already in reading this, we're all sitting there wondering, what's the meaning of this particular parable or riddle? Well, it begins with a great eagle. That would be a large majestic bird that comes into Lebanon which was the part just north of Israel and took the highest branch from a cedar tree. Lebanon was known for its great tall cedar trees and then the eagle carried it to a land of trade. Now it's interesting to note that often the eagle in scripture particularly the Old Testament is used to represent God's punitive power. Wherever you see the eagle. That particularly over in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 49. Where God spoke of the enemies that he would bring in to take the people away in judgment. And also the idea of speed. An eagle is, is quick. And... Uh, as far as the sky is concerned, just like the lion is king of the jungle, you'd have to say the eagle is the king of the sky. Any kind of bird that it wants to take, it can take. And here it says it, he took some of the seed of the land. The eagle used some of the seed from the land of the cedar tree and planted it in a fertile field where it became a spreading vine spreading forth branches. You say, well, what does all that mean? Keep reading. So often the answer's in the next couple verses. 
But before that, we get to the explanation, verses 7 and 8, comes a second eagle. It says here, there was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers, and behold, here's that word, to pause, contemplate, consider, meditate. This vine did bend her roots toward him. It's an unusual picture. As an eagle comes in, a vine begins to lean toward the eagle and shot forth her branches toward him that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. So this other eagle, again called great, it appears suddenly and the vine previously mentioned bends its roots and stretches its branches toward this second eagle. Again, what strikes us as reading here is this bird in particular doesn't have any action other than suddenly appearing. The action is in the vine leaning toward it. Whereas in the first eagle, you see that one landing in the highest branch and carrying away a seed into another land. But here it's just there, nonetheless real. And it says that he might water it. The vine did this in the hope that the second eagle would care for the vine and protect it and give it the right conditions for growth and prosperity. In contrast to the first eagle where it speaks of a judgment that was coming. But here, even though it was already under the first eagle, they had hoped, it has the vine hoping for becoming a majestic vine. You know, our children's books that we read, I know I've been reading some to my granddaughter, and the Animals are animated, they speak, they talk, trees. That's what this is in this parable, it's animated. It's designed to teach a lesson. So what were God's observations here on this vine? Well, verses 9 and 10. Say thou, thus saith the Lord God, shall it prosper. Here it's speaking of the fate of the vine, even though the vine is determined to prosper under the observation of this second eagle, even though the first eagle has already been said that it would come and take away the seed, yet here the vine was determined to change the outcome. Shall he not pull up the roots thereof? This is what the Lord's asking this question. The answer when he says, shall it prosper? The automatic answer is nay. It cannot prosper against what God has purposed. Like people today. They see and they read what God says, but they're determined to go another way. That's depravity. That's rebellion of the heart. And so the Lord says, Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither? It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. The Lord had purposed to bring down this vine. And he, did, he didn't need a lot of armies and nations and means to do it. In reality, by stretching toward this second eagle, the vine would itself uproot itself and be condemned by its very actions. And so we see here the representation of this vine that both the vine and the eagles are under the sovereign power of God. He's the one directing the eagles and he's determined the outcome of the vine. Oh, that we would know and understand that when we see things going on and wonder about the outcome. Well, you don't need to wonder about the outcome. It's going to be exactly as God has purposed. Our God reigns. Now we get to the part where I said if you're reading, 
The scripture's its own best interpreter. Verse 10, it says, Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper, shall it not utterly wither? Even the east, when the east wind toucheth it, it shall wither in the furrows where it grew. Well, the east wind represents, just like it brings in the eagle, the east wind represents the condemnation that would come from Babylon. Moreover, verse 11, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? In other words, in hearing Ezekiel pronounce this, they should have had some inkling that it was addressing them in their idolatry. It's like when Christ spoke in parables. It wasn't for those that were without, and yet many times they understood that he was directing that parable at them, although... It did not grant repentance. So it says, Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon, and hath taken the king's seed, and made a covenant with him, and hath taken an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be base, that it might not lift itself up, but that by keeping of his covenant it might stand. But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors unto Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that, do such things, or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? So when the Lord asks here, in verse 11, do you not know what these things mean? Ezekiel then is giving the explanation of this riddle or parable so that the readers or the listeners, I'm not sure how he communicated this to those still in Jerusalem because he communicated this from Babylon. That's where he was in exile. Could have been through messengers. There were other prophets in the land that delivered this word of the Lord or it could have been him writing this very word that we're reading right now and taking this portion down there to be declared. So what's evident is, and you want to write this next to, in the margin for explanation, the first great eagle represented then the king of Babylon. That's what it says. Behold, the king of Babylon has come to Jerusalem. He'd already come twice, and uh, he was preparing to come one final time. When it says that he came to Lebanon, Lebanon would have been where he would have traveled through on his way down to Jerusalem. Because Lebanon and Jerusalem, even though they were separate countries at that time, you remember it was to Lebanon that Solomon sent to, build, to, to bring cedars and build the temple there in Jerusalem. So there was already an alliance there. But here when it says the highest branch of the cedar that would be taken, it says here represents in verse 12 the king thereof. Well, who was the king at the time when Nebuchadnezzar first came down and began to take over Jerusalem? It was a king by the name of Jehoiakim. We studied that when we were reading through the the book of the kings and his princes. And so Nebuchadnezzar came and took him out. And it says, and led them with him to Babylon. But now verse 13, when it says, hath taken the king's seed. You go back and read in uh, the book of the kings that we studied already. And you remember that in place of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar had set up his own king, whose name was Zedekiah. You may remember that name, Zedekiah. So that's who he's talking about here. The first eagle, as you continue to read on down verse 13, made a covenant with him. That would be the first eagle represents Babylon making a covenant with Zedekiah and put him under oath. What Nebuchadnezzar 
was doing was trying to establish simply a vassal state. His, his initial intention was not to destroy Jerusalem, even though God had purposed it. And so the first eagle, Babylon, took away the mighty of the land, it says there. You remember, that's what he did not only with King Jehoiakim, but also with other notable men such as Daniel. Daniel was taken away and his companions. And he did this to keep Zedekiah low. He wanted Zedekiah to rule, but under the threat of being removed at any point. And so that was the covenant that's spoken of there in verse 13. He made a covenant with him. You can put in the margin Zedekiah. And then the king of Babylon took them with him to Babylon, which is called here the city of merchants, because that's what Babylon was at the time. It was known for its commerce and everything Babylon at that particular time. So just as the vine here stretched out its roots and branches toward the second eagle, that's representative of Zedekiah that rebelled after Nebuchadnezzar had established him as king, rebelled against him, refused to pay tribute, and actually sent ambassadors to Egypt. And Egypt here represents the second eagle. So your first eagle is Babylon. Second eagle is that one that Zedekiah now sought an alliance with, thinking that somehow he would be protected. Zedekiah had hoped for horses. As it says there in verse 15, he, when it says he rebelled against him, he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar in sending ambassadors into Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. He was trying to shore things up to protect the city against the attack of Babylon, even though the Lord had already said the city would be taken. You can see how people scheme and devise means to try to get around what's clearly revealed in the word, and they do so to their own demise. How foolish it is for any to stand against Almighty God and uh, will face certain ruin. Even Babylon used as its symbol an eagle. This is a little bit frightening when you think that even the United States has an eagle as its symbol of power and strength. And yet the same is true of the United States as would be true of Babylon. It would have no power at all were it not given of the Lord. And just as the Lord raised up Babylon and took it down, don't think that he can't do the same thing with the United States because all are under his sovereign power. And woe be to any, just like here, the vine stretching toward certain alliances politically, thinking it's somehow to be safe. If the Lord's purpose, condemnation, you're not going to stand against it. You can store up all the cans you want to, of canned food and ammunition, all this stuff you hear people talking about today. Well, go have at it. All the Lord has to do is take you out in your cave. You know, people are foolish when they think that somehow by the arm of the flesh we're going to stand our ground. Really? If the Lord has purposed the downfall of this nation, I would say the downfalling because it's pretty evident it's been downfalling for some time and it's idolatry and rebellion against the Lord. I know people pledge allegiance, you know, one nation under God, but it's under little G-O-D in their minds. It's not the sovereign God same sort of rebellion exists today. So if we haven't learned from history, what does it say? You're bound, it's bound to repeat it. But here specifically, this had to do with what was going on in Israel in that day. And the Lord asks, will he prosper? Can Zedekiah do such things by seeking help from Egypt of all places? Remember that the Lord had already said, don't go down to Egypt. That We read that in Jeremiah. Because the Lord had purposed that Nebuchadnezzar go all the way down to Egypt and take Egypt captive. And can he break this covenant, Zedekiah, and do, so, 
do so without impunity, no, w or with impunity, no. Zedekiah was a covenant breaker, and again, you can read about all this in 2 Kings 24. Just write that next to the margin. Even Jeremiah and Ezekiel accused Zedekiah of disloyalty and urged submission to Babylon. But he was, what they were telling him was, you, you might as well submit because one way or another you're going to be taken. So that's where we see it here in verses 16 to 18 where we're going to have to stop. And the rest of the story we'll get next time. But as I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king, whose oath he despised. So it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar having made Zedekiah king in the place of Jehoiakim, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he break, even with him in the midst of Babylon he shall die. So even though Nebuchadnezzar had set Zedekiah up and he would have been the last of the Judah, uh, of kings of Judah, and yet he would not die there in Jerusalem. He would be carried away captive. It says, neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant when lo, he had given his hand and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. And we know in the rest of the story, as they say, that Zedekiah was indeed taken out of Jerusalem and died in the midst of Babylon exactly as the Lord said should take place there in verse 16 even with him in the midst of Babylon he shall die here again if you want you can go back to 2 Kings 25 you want to write that in the margin because Zedekiah did indeed die in Babylon but it was under the most frightening and terrible of circumstances all this is described in 2 Kings 25. This is where scripture explains scripture. But they first of all, and we saw this in Jeremiah, killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And then they took and put out Zedekiah's eyes. So the last visible thing that he saw was his sons being slaughtered. And then they put out his eyes. And they bound him with bronze fetters and they took him to Babylon. We saw that in Jeremiah 52, in verse 11. And that's where Zedekiah remained until his death. And Pharaoh, with his mighty army and great company, could not dissuade what God had purposed. That's why it was foolish for them to lean, this vine to lean toward that second eagle for any kind of help. And so it was that the will of the Lord was accomplished. So we'll stop there. The rest of the chapter has to do still with Zedekiah and how the Lord dealt with Judah in uh, taking Zedekiah out. But in all things, the Lord's will be done. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. Oh, that we might slow down in our reading and consider each scripture even as you say behold to pause and consider even a riddle or a parable that's given how we need your spirit to be our teacher and our instructor but i'm thankful that as you have been so you are you're the sovereign god and where you've purposed judgment none can stay your hand or say unto you what doest thou and where you've purposed deliverance even as here we see in the case of Daniel and his companions and Ezekiel, Jeremiah, there were those that you preserved in the midst of all of this, not because they deserved better than the others, but because you're a merciful God and gracious in whom you set that grace upon for Christ's sake. They are indeed delivered. So I pray that you would excite within our hearts a desire to bow to you and your will in all things and to wait upon you in all things. And uh, we give you the praise and honor and glory in Christ's precious name, amen. Hymn number 57, Jesus, I am resting. There's one word that we're gonna change here. It just doesn't sit right when you see the rest of it. 
In the verse 3, it says, Ever lift thy face upon me as I work. <laughs> well, you're either waiting or you're working. So let's sing that as I sit and wait on thee. Resting neath thy smile, Lord Jesus, earth's dark shadows flee. That's what we're to do. Sit at Christ's feet and wait on him. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon thee, and thy beauty fills my soul. For by thy transforming power thou hast made me whole. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of who thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Simply trusting thee, Lord Jesus, I behold thee as thou art. And thy love so pure, so changeless, satisfies my heart. Satisfies its deepest longings, meat supplies its every need. Compasseth me round with blessings, thine is love indeed. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of who thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Ever lift thy face upon me as I sit and wait on thee. Resting neath thy smile, Lord Jesus, earth's dark shadows flee. Brightness of my Father's glory, sunshine of my Father's face. Keep me ever trusting, resting, fill me with thy grace. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of who thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and look in Matthew chapter 15 as we continue to study these miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ in their chronological order. And so we come to Matthew 15. My text is from verse 21 down to verse 28. And I've entitled this message, Mercy for a Gentile Dog. You think, wow, that's a pretty strong title there. Well, it comes right from this particular portion of scripture concerning this woman who was a Gentile that came to Christ beseeching his mercy on behalf of her daughter. So you can see here a mother's prayer on behalf of her daughter. And you can understand the love and the compassion that a mother would have with a daughter in the particular state that this daughter was in. And yet we find her seeking help nowhere else but to the Lord himself. And we're going to see why that title, A Gentile Dog. But let's read this. For Matthew 15, beginning with verse 21. You can see, then Jesus went thence. So... We saw last time how he was in that northern part of 
Israel, actually over in the land on, uh, uh, near Capernaum, but from there he went here and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. So rather than move back down into physical Israel itself, he goes up out of the land of Tyre and Sidon into Lebanon. That's where Tyre and Sidon were. And behold, a woman of Canaan. So there again, behold. Stop, consider, pause, meditate. Of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Now we're going to see how the Lord dealt with her here in three different ways as she approached him. First of all, he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. It's as if, since the Lord didn't answer a word, then she turned to the disciples to seek them to beseech him on her behalf. But he answered and said, so here's this, when he does speak, here's what he says. I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Here she is, a Canaanite, a Gentile. And he's speaking of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so in her mind, not having any Jewish descent, you would think then she would despair. And primarily, when Christ did come, he began with that house of Israel. He didn't come to try to save the entire house of Israel. He came to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel, those that were his, given him of the Father. Even Paul said, they're not all Israel that are Israel, but there is that seed according to promise. There's some today that think that somehow God's purpose is to save the entire nation, and since he didn't do it when Christ came the first time, then he's going to come back and do it the second time. That's not what the scriptures teach. Put a big X through that kind of thinking. It's always been a people, a remnant, according to the election of grace, whether Jew or Gentile. That's what the scriptures teach. That's the true Israel. That's what Romans refers to in Romans 11 when it says, And so all Israel shall be saved. All God's true Israel, not the nation of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, so this is the third reaction, if you want to put it that way, but the second response, because first he didn't say a word. Second, he said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, thirdly, he answered and said, it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. That was typically a term that the Jews used, which was derogatory toward Gentiles. And you think, well, is the Lord identifying with their thinking with regard to the Gentiles? Clearly not, because he was the one drawing this woman all along anyway. And there's an interesting thought here that we'll get to. Hold that thought. Not all dogs are equal, are they? Scriptures speak of ravenous dogs that represent those that seek to devour anything that pertains to the truth or to Christ. Paul warned against such dogs like ravenous wolves. So what is, what is this? Who are these dogs? Well, this is a different kind of dog because these are in the house. You got dogs out there running wild in the world, wild dogs. But don't we all or at least some of us have dogs that are part of our household and our family. And so Christ is saying here, it's not good to take the children's bread and give it to dogs, even if those dogs are in the household. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. We've got three dogs. And when we sit down to eat, they're nearby. 
they're waiting for some sort of scrap or whatever. Especially they like it when the grandkids are there because they, they get sloppy and the food's flying and dropping and boy, they're, they're going after it. Crumbs from the master's table. You can't shoo them away. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. That was the surprise of mercy right there. Not only that she came to plead for her daughter, but that upon Christ's command, that daughter was healed that very hour. So there's a lot in here for us to consider. But let's come back to verses 21 and 22, where our Lord is met by this Gentile woman. Now, just like with the demoniac of the Gadarenes, Christ crossed the sea for that one demoniac, delivered him, and got right back in the boat and left. Even here, when it says that our Lord went to that region of Tyre and Sidon, these were Gentile cities located some 60 miles away. And what was the purpose for our Lord going there? Just like he said in John chapter 4, I must needs go through Samaria. And when he went through Samaria, it was for one woman at that well. Why does it say here that he departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon? As far as we can tell, it was for one woman, this one woman, that he already had his eye set upon. This was one that the Father had given him, and now he must needs go. So all the while, in his providence, he's going to her, and unbeknownst to her, he's, by his Spirit, drawing her to himself. Because after this, in verse 28, what do you read in verse 29? And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> Turn right around. And you can imagine the disciples wondering what? into these Gentile cities. Well, we know it was for this one woman. And you stop and think how it is today, any one of us, as Gentile dogs, know anything of Christ. He had his eye upon us, being given of the Father. And he knew us well before we knew him. And when we look back right now, and see how it was he drew us to himself. We have to say certainly he purposed that our path should cross with him. Else we would never have come to him. So here Matthew uses that old term. She was from Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman. But he uses that old term Canaanite. And shows that she could not be separated from her ancestry. No matter where she lived. She was, the Canaanites, stop and think about it, they were a cursed nation. And yet here was a woman, just like Ruth of Moab. Yes, a cursed nation, but out of it, a remnant, according to the election of grace. And so our Lord went there. But also, you see here that her heart had already been prepared. This is a Gentile woman. But look what she cries out when she encounters him. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. How would she know anything about Christ being the son of David according to what the scriptures declared? Well, she must have heard. Maybe word carried over from some that had been healed in that northern part of Galilee. Word spread, his fame spread all over. Who is he? He's the Lord, the son of David. She certainly could have not learned this herself apart from the spirit teaching her and drawing her. I think of the Ethiopian eunuch giving the scriptures, reading and asking, and then the Lord bringing Philip. And Philip asking, do you understand what you read? How can I unless someone explain? But here is a Gentile woman Amazing grace who understood who the Lord Jesus was. 
even more than any of the countrymen to whom Christ came when he said he came unto his own, his own received him not. Who makes us to differ? It's the Lord. It's his spirit. It's his word. And so we are not told how it was that this woman would have learned who Christ is and been able to cry unto him in the right way. Have mercy on me. What's she asking for? Mercy. She's a mercy beggar. Oh, Lord. He's the Father's Lord. He's God's Lord. He's God's Savior. Thou Son of David, that one that was promised of the seed of David that should come and did come. So here we find that in this encounter, the Spirit had already prepared her heart. Now we see that specifically more as we read on here in the various responses of the Lord Jesus toward her. Because regardless of whatever obstacle that the Lord put in her way, he wasn't making it easy on her, that she didn't go away. It's like the Lord asked the disciples when so many that had followed him for a while left there in John 6 and he said will you also go away what they answered whom shall we go thou art the one who has the words of eternal life who can draw a sinner to Christ except for the spirit of Christ who is it that keeps the sinner looking to Christ in spite of all the obstacles and we have many doubts within and, and fears without and yet, this woman, nothing could shake her confidence in the Lord. That's why I say it was the Lord drawing her all the while. But first, he answered her not a word there in verses 23 and 24. Here was a Gentile mother interceding for her daughter. Some people get really touchy-feely. Oh, come on, Lord, you can at least show mercy because, look, at it's her daughter. That's not how God works. That's not how Christ works. It's not out of sympathy. There were many others, I'm sure, in the land that had daughters in the same situation, but the Lord never delivered any of them. It was to this one woman. And she knew it because she was asking for mercy. What's mercy but not receiving what she deserved? Grace is, is God's favor in giving what he's purposed, but we don't deserve mercy. We deserve condemnation. But our Lord did not immediately give her an encouraging reply. You see, that's the difference between so-called evangelists today. As soon as they see somebody showing a little interest, okay, well then, all you have to do is say a sinner's prayer and you'll be accepted. Here it said, the Lord answered her not a word. I know some that have struggled with this because they read the word. They read how it is that God has purposed to save sinners, and yet they find no word from the Lord for themselves. They struggle with it. Am I the Lord's or am I not? And sadly, some become hardened by it. They seek another way. They go away. Well, if they go away, they never were the Lord's. To whom shall we go? It's interesting here that the word, that's who Christ is, spoke not a word. It's a reminder that he does not have to reveal himself when we think. Sometimes we might pray that, Lord, I need a word from you today, and you're struggling with your unbelief and darkness. And so you think, well, I'll just turn to the word, and certainly the Lord will speak a word to me. Maybe not. He may, in his wisdom, keep you bowed at his feet until such time as he speaks the word. Don't go running off looking for help from somebody else. And I find here an interesting interpretation that I had not really thought about until I got studying this a little more. When the disciples, he didn't answer a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away for she crieth after us. My original thinking on this was they were annoyed by her. Just send her away, Lord. You don't need to deal with her. You don't have to answer her. But that's not really what they were saying. 
they were attempting to influence our Lord to give her what she wanted. And so they were as much as saying here, Lord, just give her what she wants and send her away. As if you know what you're going to do. So just go ahead and do it. Well, you don't dictate to the Lord what he's going to do. The reason I say that is because that word send her away, if you look over in Luke chapter 2 and verse 29, that same verb is used there in Luke chapter 2 in verse 29 it says well verse 28 then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said this is Simeon in the temple Lord now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word and that depart in peace is the same word in the Greek as send her away. In other words, Lord, just go ahead and send her away in peace. But again, it's going to be in the Lord's time because the Lord is the sovereign. Yes, it was purposed all along that she should have mercy, else she would not be there. But we're not going to dictate to the Lord when, where, and how he shows mercy. And there we see then his second response in verse 24 where he says, I'm not sent but unto the law sheep of the house of Israel. And as, as I've already explained, he's not speaking here of that he was sent just for the house of Israel as if it was the entire nation. No, but the key there is lost sheep. Who are the lost sheep? In John 6, it's those that the Father gave him. And so, even here would be the Lord reminding, because he did not ultimately turn her down, but he's reminding her of the kind of sinners that he came to save. And the key there is lost sheep. She was certainly not of the physical house of Israel, but she was one of the lost sheep of the spiritual house of Israel. Remember, Christ himself is Israel. He's the true Israel of God. And so all those sheep are his. But that's, he's reminding her here that it's not even based on her coming. A lot of people like to Preach up how you come. Be careful how you come. And all the focus is on coming and seeing. No. It's on who's doing the drawing and who's doing the saving. I was not sent but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who he saves. He's going to have every one of his sheep. And so even here he's teaching her. And you can see her response. This is why I say it was the spirit of Christ drawing her and keeping her there all the while. Because she cried out, Lord, what? Help me. Sometimes that's all you can cry. You don't know. We don't know how to pray as we ought. But certainly, we can cry out like she did, Lord, help me. If he's drawing us and we have many obstacles in the way, our own sin being the greatest, and we understand that we don't deserve him to deal with us even in mercy, Yet it's the Lord that gives the cry. Lord, help me. Just like that man on behalf of his son cried out, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And you can see it says that she what? Worshipped him. Then came she and worshipped him. The worship of Christ. How was it that she was able to worship him? Even in the face of what the Lord was saying to her. These hard sayings. I know people today say that, boy, the gospel you preach, it's a hard gospel. Because you don't leave any room for the sinner. Nope. It's all in the hands of a mighty Savior. All in the hands of a sovereign God who determines who he will save and who he doesn't. And there are some that because of that, they shrug their shoulders and they turn and say, well, if that's the way it is, then I'm going to go my way. Well, if you do, that just means certain condemnation. And it means there was never any work of the spirit in your heart anyway I'll tell you those that God has chosen 
He draws to Christ. It was for them that Christ came to pay the sin debt. When he came in this world, it was when it, he's called the, the Savior of the world. It was for Jew and Gentile. It's in the ethnic sense, and not everybody. And he was proving this, and even how he was drawing this Gentile dog to himself. But that's how the Lord does it. And so <clears throat> he didn't even send her away to do something. Well, go back and think about it, and if you're really serious, then come back again and uh, put her through all kinds of hoops. No. He just stated the truth to her, and then she bowed. Why did she bow and worship him? Why did she say, Lord, help me? Well, it's because she knew if she went away, if she didn't stay right there, there would be no help. And then the third response he's, he gave her it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs here's the part I wanted to explain to you about the difference between ravenous dogs which there were plenty there of which Paul warned in Philippians 3 2 just look over there real quickly with me in Philippians chapter 3 so not all dogs are equal you say well we're all dead dog sinners that's true, but not all dogs are equal. There are dead dog sinners that are left to their own reprobate mind, and the scriptures say here, beware of them. Paul said that. Finally, brethren, in Philippians 3, 1, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you to say, beware of dogs. And that means wild pack dogs. Beware of evil workers. Who were the evil workers? They were ones that were promoting their own works, religion, self-righteousness. And beware of the concision. That's a play on words of, of circumcision. That's talking about these Jews that required circumcision to be able to be identified with the kingdom of God. But here the word that Paul uses is mutilation. Beware of the mutilation. Who are the true Israel. He says there in verse 3, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. Secondly, rejoice in Christ Jesus. And thirdly, have no confidence in the flesh. That would fit this Gentile woman right here. So when the Lord was saying to her, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. Notice, little dogs. He's saying to this woman that these little dogs are ones that are already part of his household and not in a derogatory sense as we've seen the harshest word dogs in Philippians 3 2 doesn't apply here here it would have to do with household dogs that's why they're even there around the master's table and belonging to the family that had their portion, even though not necessarily children. Well, we know today, if you've got dogs in your family, they're like your children. But did that dog just run into your house and become a part of you? No, you chose that dog. And likely paid the price to have that dog belong unto you, to adopt it and then to domesticate it. Isn't that a beautiful picture of who we are as sinners. He could have left us out there as ravenous dogs. But here he's describing his mercy. And uh, saying that it's not good to take the children's bread and just give it to dogs. But she said, verse 27 again, truth Lord. Yet the dogs eat. When she says that, she's talking about those dogs that are part of, part of that family. Oh, to be a dog in the household of Christ. I'd, I'd be happy to be that dog. To be blessed as a dog. And so it's as if she said, Lord, I understand that your purpose in coming is indeed for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But what I'm asking for is to be just a little dog in your household where when you cause those crumbs to fall from your table, that I can partake. Oh, the drop, the crumbs of grace, the crumbs of that mercy. 
And you can see what faith she was given when she says there, truth, Lord, yet the dogs, yet even. She's not contradicting the Lord. She's reminding him that yet even, even so, Lord, you can see how, the, how in her heart she could not walk away. You know, I know there's some that I've dealt with, even now some that I know of, that think that, well, what if I'm not one of the elect? That's how they reason. And uh, they use that then as a, an excuse not to stay at his feet, not to come. But you notice here, this woman does not battle with that truth at all. Yes, Lord. That's what she says. Truth, Lord. And bows. She doesn't raise any question about it. But she simply goes on pleading. Lord, help me. Lord, have mercy upon me. And I believe that's the evidence of true faith. I want to come back here next time, just this one verse, because there's so much in here, and it requires more time than what I can give it at the end of this message. And so we'll look at what is great faith? Because he says, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. There are a lot of people that look at that and see, aha, see, it does depend upon your faith. Well, when he says, great is thy faith, what faith would she have had it not been given her? And great is the object of thy faith. Where she was looking, great is the object of your faith. I can talk about your eyes, how pretty they are, or your hair, your complexion of your skin, and talk about that being, but how would you have it but what it was given you? But I want to come back here because I've noted here seven different descriptions of what great faith is, and uh, the Lord willing, that'll be the title of the next message, Great Faith. And I pray the Lord will prepare our hearts as we consider it together. We'll leave it there for now. Hymn number 235, Ask Me Not, O Gentle Savior, Hear My Humble Cry. Certainly this is what we see in this Gentile dog, this woman, Ask Me Not. Ask Me Not, O Gentle Savior, Hear My Humble Cry, While on others Thou art called. Do not pass me by, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at a throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling do not pass me by trusting only in thy merit would i seek thy face Heal my wounded, broken spirit. Save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art called. Do not pass.
pass me by, Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed and look forward to the next time, Lord willing.